Some of us don't know who Nanny Helen Burroughs is, and often uh, she is one of the most overlooked characters of the civil rights movement, uh, and as well, just the American movement of freedom and liberty. Uh, I want to present to you a tribute that was done to Nanny Helen Burroughs, and we will come back and we will talk with none other than the Colonel James Wyatt, who is the founder of the Nanny Helen Burroughs Project. I saw this street named after Nanny Helen Burroughs, so I wanted to know who is Nanny Helen Burroughs, and I was told that she was a woman who had started a school in Washington, so I went to the school. And there was a photo of Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, James Walden Johnson, sitting next to Nanny Helen Burroughs. And when the principal directed me to the Library of Congress, I went there and found 110,000 pieces of information. I went from playing golf three times a week, I quit that day and lived in the Library of Congress for the next two years studying her life. What sparked my interest in Nanny Helen Burroughs is that she reminded me of my own mother, my grandmother, and the black women in my life. Nanny Helen Burroughs represent the paragon of black womanhood with a determined commitment to express her own sense of agency and gifts even when women were not allowed to share who they were in public spaces of the black church and in public spaces in the country. I found the motto of a women's professional and business organization in New Jersey. And the motto was, we're beholden to the past. We are shaping the present. We are responsible for the future. That to me was Nanny Helen Burroughs. She had the most profound way of gathering the power of her passion and presenting it before bodies all across this nation. And she was determined not only to represent black womanhood, but the humanity of black people. And she refused to let anything reduce her sense of herself and her sense of her being black and a woman in any of the venues of this nation. She told us that we had to learn to appreciate the past, but that we had to go forward with the children for the future because she was, she was intrigued or wedded to one of Frederick Douglass's quotes, which is, it is easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. I think the most important thing for the next generation to know and carry forth from icons like Nana Helen Burroughs is that number one, there must be deep commitment to what is right, to what truth represents. There must be a deep commitment to freedom and justice. And that was what she demonstrated. Nanny was a person who believed in, uh, I think I would quote it as saying, the diversity of ideas. Although if you were to hear her talk, you might think that she felt that she had the only idea. But I really feel that it was cooperation. One speech that we may all recall is a speech, you know, if the women weren't hindered, if the women were set free, if the women could serve fully as they are able and capable of serving. I profoundly uh, take forward from her life the commitment to what's true and commitment to justice and a commitment to holistic understanding of people in a way where no one gets excluded in terms of the gifts and skills. Nana's legacy should be, it was preparing our young people for the future uh, without fear of apology about what they've learned. Preparing them to, to take care of the environment in which they live, but most of all to, 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 to live a clean life, a good Christian life. As it relates to American Baptist College, we want 
every black woman who comes here seeking to be a minister or to do work in, beyond the church to know the life and story of Nana Helen Burris because that story will tell them that black women are the matriarchs and saviors of care and passion of our people. A tribute to Nanny Helen Burroughs, the four person in terms of that tribute being Colonel James Wyatt. We thank you for your service to God and country foremost, sir. But I got to ask you tonight in a time period where our children languish at home, not in the classroom, uh, where they're being told that if they have in different viewpoints from the masses, that they should be silenced. And while they may be the hope that we sing about, like with Whitney Houston, um, they seem to be lost in all of the political correctness of our age. Are we doing justice to Danny Helen Burroughs when it comes to our children? Kenneth, um, well, I'm very full, you know, just watching the tribute, even though I was a part of it. Your question is, is a very powerful question, and let me try to answer it by adding a bit first yes. to a few things about what you open with about Nanny Helen Burrs, because... As we talk about her, and as the president of the American Baptist College was talking about women, I'm absolutely at a loss to understand how Nanny Helen Burroughs is lost to America, but more specifically to the church and to our black women. Mm -hmm. Let me repeat that. I go around speaking I've done this for 12 years. I'm going to talk to you about an opinion piece that I put in the paper here in Annapolis uh, yesterday. Yes. yes. But I'm astounded that Nanny Helen Burroughs is lost to our black church and to our women, particularly our black women. You talked about her relationship with God, or you talked about God. In the book, The Nanny Helen Burroughs Story by Dr. Sandra Washington, here's a passage. Mm -hmm. Her relationship with God was so strong that it overflowed into every aspect of her life and work, making it difficult to draw clear lines between her religious educational, political, and social interests. Mm. Her relationship with God was so strong that when she spoke of any aspects of the things that we face in life, they were connected. She passed in 1961, and here's a statement by a white woman supporter in 1964, I found it in the archives at the Library of Congress. Miss Burr's influence over her people can hardly be estimated. Measured not as a Negro woman, but as a woman, she had extraordinary ability and her living faith in God and in all of her children of whatever race, her spirit of service and sacrifice energize her gifts as only faith and love can do. That's that's how she lived her life. So here again, we, we talk about the children, we talk about God, we talk about Nanny Helen Burroughs. What, what, what was her message? What, what did she try to say to her? I had the, the good pleasure of meeting a Mary Alice Dorsett, who's a student 
at the Nanny Helen Burroughs School, then the National Training School for Negro Women and Girls. She was there from 1947 to 1951, and she had been sent there from Augusta, Georgia, Tabernacle Baptist Church by uh, Dr. Lowry, who became a very prominent pastor and civil rights uh, leader in uh, Tampa, Florida. Yes. Yes. And she was close to Miss Burroughs, and, and here was the message that Miss Burroughs, according to her, gave to us. The people do not apply my teachings. When I speak, they agree with me, laugh, give me standing ovations and applause, but that's the end of it. Perhaps when I'm dead, if someone will share my teachings with them, they might apply them. If so, they will improve themselves economically, intellectually, politically, and socially, and this will make them first-class citizens. I leave this responsibility to you. And this is what Mary Alice Dorsett did until the day she died uh, two years ago. Yes. And yes. when I had the great opportunity to meet her, she, she sent me a, a letter which she had sent to her children saying, I've asked Colonel Wyatt to come and speak at my birthday, her 85th birthday, which was in uh, 2011, and at my funeral. And I did that in 2017. Wow. So I opened this talking about Nanny Helen Burroughs and what she meant to Mary Alice Dorset and what she meant to so many of us because since I discovered her in 2008, my life has been dedicated to her and I must tell you that um, I am still perplexed by why she is lost to the church and to our people. I think maybe it was because Nanny forced us to look at ourselves and to take accountability of our actions and our lack of actions. Mm -hmm. um, as I go about speaking with her, I've observed one thing. Yes. And that one thing is that the great historians who write about Nanny always say she fought racism. She fought discrimination, and she did. But I never hear that she equally sought cooperation mm. between the races. And that cooperation, she explains in a 1923 letter that she wrote in the West Virginia Women's Voice newspaper. And I, I use a... Uh, an excerpt out of that letter or that article in an opinion piece that I put in the paper yesterday. Yes. I mentioned this opinion piece because, and there it is, and I'll read the quote that I'm talking about. Um, I am so proud that on the opinion page of that paper, the op-ed is highlighted with Nanny Helen Burris. Yes. And I've already begun to get letters of people who say, Colonel, we never heard of her. But wow. my God, this woman, wow. how can how can she be lost to us? And let me tell you what she says in that letter, and I want to then connect that with what seems to be happening in our country today. Yes, sir. She wrote in the letter, white women and Negro women need to come together. But there are real dangers ahead. Politics affords an opportunity for exploitation and bargaining. Mm. The unscrupulous and unworthy are enrolled in all political parties and can be bought and sold. That's the, the excerpt. In that excerpt, she's talking about cooperation be, 
between the races. And the reason I wrote this op-ed and the reason that the instant election is good news and bad news, the good news is it's giving me a chance to try in a more in-depth way to try to get people to understand who Nanny Helen Bars is. Yes. Now, yes. I wrote the op-ed because uh, President-elect Joe Biden on national TV said, if you vote for Donald Trump, you ain't black. Yeah. And if you were to read this op-ed, you will see that Jim White says, I am a very proud black man. Okay? Yes. And, yeah. and, it, and it is that proudness that I speak about Nanny Helen Burroughs because while she fought racism, she also sought cooperation between the races. And I think that's a message that, and I try to stay away from talking about Republicans and Democrats. Yeah. But yeah. in this instance, I have to do that because um, it seems that we're making everything about race. Mm -hmm. And my, and that seems to be coming from the Democratic Party. And I've said to people that if we make everything about race, everything is going to be about race. And I'm afraid that that's going to fracture us more. Listen to what Manny said in 1956. Yes, sir. Today, terrible conditions and serious race tensions and conflicts are tormenting the lives of people in both races in every section of the country, 1956. Mm -hmm. And then in 1960, she said, the day of this has come out of centuries of suffering, but the weapons of black warfare must not, I repeat, must not be frustration and hate. Mm. Rather, African Americans must use education, improvement of home and family life, and Christian living to achieve their goals. And this is where I think the church has let us down. And I say this openly, particularly as I look at the public broadcast system five years ago wrote a series called The Black Church mm -hmm. and they're rewriting or extending that series in February of 2021 and at the Library of Congress they were referred to me by Miss Adrian Cannon they said please go and talk to Colonel Wyatt because he will help you understand something about Nanny Helen Burroughs and the black church. Now, let me read you what was in the series five years ago. Okay. Here is Nanny. We might as well be frank and face the truth. The majority of our religious leaders have preached too much heaven and too little Christian living does the absorbing task of supplying their personal needs bind leaders to moral, social, spiritual needs of our people? Men must welcome women into the affairs of government. Women must organize and educate. There will be protests against politics in the church, but it is better to have politics than ignorance. Here again is Nanny, who is talking about how the sisters are hindered from helping and I agree with the fact that even today the sisters do not seem to appreciate that she gave her entire life to the betterment of our women and our children. I'll say much later, but I had to open with those passionate things, Kim. I, I feel I, your passion, feel and we've also shared that passion one to the other um, regarding the political environment that 
our children have been placed in today, they have been uh, offered to go back to schools where Black Lives Matter flags wave uh, and there is preaching of intolerance of the right race um, merely because they have a genetic melanin uh, count that goes in the opposite direction. Uh, we are to hate the white man simply because he is the white man. Yes. All, all white people are this and all black people are that. And in fact, it was Joe Biden who basically asserted that black people were monolithic in thought. Uh, yes. And so we are at a time right now where Black Lives Matter's founders have sent a letter to the quote unquote president elect basically stating that you owe us and we expect dividend upon that which we created. And we went through a summer of looting and rioting and murdering. And it seems that our children are learning rather than through compromise and discussion that by force you get your way. Am I on the right pathway, sir? You are on the right path. And in her book, Think on These Things, uh, 1952 is exactly what Nanny said, is about cooperation. Um, but even in 1934, she had some very harsh words. You know, she was the first woman to give the commencement speech at Tuskegee Institute in 1934. Wow. And 6,000 people, black and white, showed up on the campus. And during part of her talking and speaking, uh, there was a white reporter there who was a critic. Mm -hmm. And he challenged her about white supremacy and, and, and how this is the ruination of America. And let me tell you part of Nanny's response, which is the problem that we still seem to have within our own race. Here's her response. And it may be one of the reasons that we don't hear much about her. White supremacy and economic hardship are only part of the problem. We have, as a race, a crisis of the soul wow. that we must fix within ourselves. And she went on to speak about the crisis of the need for leaders with long range a vision who could see 50 or 100 years hence and make plans to that end. This, she said, will develop the next generation, whether it be 25, 50, or 100 years hence, a type of man and woman stronger and more durable mentally, socially, and spiritually. So there Nanny was, 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 was talking about how we're talking about white supremacy. It goes, it really goes along with the 12 things the Negro must do for himself, which she wrote in 1928, which on my website, I have changed, I have rephrased it to say things we must, we must teach our children. Well, one of those things is she says, we've got to stop blaming all of our problems on other people. Exactly. And take responsibility exactly. for ourselves. And she's relentless in talking to us about how we must take responsibility because, and she talks about what the country owes us. So in this, in this diverse way of tying her religious views to, to the economic situation in the country and everything else, I'm reminded of a letter that she wrote in 1940 to President Roosevelt. And it goes along with what's happening again today when she said, uh, Mr. President, it seems that you would rather see the Negro uh, fed from the 
hundreds of billions of dollars that fall from the government table as opposed to having a decent job. You encourage people to come in from foreign countries to do work here. Immigrants come in to do work. Those people take part of their money and send it back home to build homes, to put in banks, and to do other things. The Negro is the only one who spends all of his earnings here in the United States. Mm. And yet you seem to have a preference for people coming in from other places to take the jobs that he should have. Doesn't that sound remarkably like today's? Sounds remarkably like the current, or, or for, forgive me, the future administration's pursuit of, uh, of expanding uh, immigration, tearing down walls, and showing yes. preference to the world than at home. And under the past administration, or the current administration, Donald Trump brought the unemployment rate for African Americans to the lowest level in American history. And yet, yes. he's called a racist. Uh, he brought down yes. the Hispanic unemployment rate to the lowest level in American history. And yet, he's considered a bigot. And on top of that, the whole concept of free markets, Nanny Helen Burroughs did not want the American people living off the tit of the government, but to be right. able to sow their seed or drop their bucket, as Booker T. Washington said, where they yes. were, and to grow and mature financially. We are at a level in our country where black Americans own less homes, owns less land, and owns fewer businesses than any other group. But should we blame white America because of that? Well, I think that's the problem that we have, and that's the frustration. Nanny said I shouldn't have frustration. But I'm not frustrated about the white man is doing. I'm frustrated because I cannot cannot get a fluid, decent conversation going within our own race, at least to hear different alternatives. Now, I'm going to say something here that may be a little contradictory. Yes, sir. Uh, not contradictory, but it's, um, it's a pretty poignant statement, and this is where I am in this issue now. I have the same problem within my fraternity. Wow. Okay? A few years ago, I'm going to tell you a story, when there was a big march... Uh, uh, gathering at the Lincoln Memorial and uh, Reverend Sharpton uh, wrote all of the fraternities and sororities and said we're going to march uh, we're going to protest uh, the protest was to start behind the M Street School or now Dunbar which was Nanny Helen Burroughs School mm -hmm. and I approached my fraternity leader and I said you know, Brother Leader, um, in my hometown paper this morning, Norfolk, Virginia, there's an article which says by Clarence B. Jones, who wrote Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech. Yes. And he said, Dr. King would not be unhappy to see 500,000 people with divergent views coming together to speak about the future of America. So I said, uh, Brother Leader, uh, could we discuss why we're marching before we march? <laughs> I never got a response. And I just happened to be the oldest, the oldest member in the chapter. 87-year-old person now. I've been through a lot of racism. Yeah. But Nanny Helen yeah. Burris tells us how we've got to get out of this. And I see us uh, digging a deeper hole. There's an old, not an old saying, but when you're in a hole, don't dig. <laughs> I feel like we're in a hole, we're digging. And another saying that I have is, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. And I think the only way that we're really going to find out where we're going is if we can sit down first and have a discussion among ourselves. For example... I don't understand why we're not debating the 1619 project 
advocated by the New York Times, and the 1776 Project, advocated by Bob Woodson. Yes. Why can't we come together and talk about those? I would like to see more of our black leaders who are conservative doing what you're doing. I've written to a lot of them and said, let's, let's evoke the name of Nanny Helen Burroughs. Oh, I'm concerned that people may be saying, well, these thoughts are original with me. <laughs> but I would like to see, I would like to see Nanny made the, the essence of our conversation first among ourselves. And I will tell you, I cannot get that conversation going in the church where she uh, uh, started Woman's Day. Because as I, as I say to people, you know, even the best books written about her, I say again, people say, Nanny Helen Burroughs fought racism. And I said, she did more. She sought cooperation. Mm -hmm. And so that's the path that I'm on, Kenneth. And so the instant election is, uh, is sort of like my behavioral science teacher or my behavioral science guru in grad school wrote a book, Frederick Hertzberg, and he said, job enrichment is not about being happy. It's about not being unhappy. So while I may not be happy with the results of the election, I'm not unhappy because it's given me an opportunity as a black man to talk about how proud that I am to look at things that I thought we were making progress. And as an 87 year old, God knows I've shared my sense of racism, but I think that uh, we can do better as a race. I agree with you. I only have a few more moments with you. Um, and there are like a million questions that flow through my mind as I talk with you as, as always. Colonel, and you know you this will not be the last time you're with me because I think over the next two years, to be honest, a lot of angry, bitter, uh, unsatiated blacks will see exactly what they got when they went to the voting booth uh, a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. They unfortunately didn't kick the tires because they were too angry and just wanted to buy the first used car off the lot. And unfortunately, the principles of Nanny Helen Burroughs are so evident when you apply them to what is being lit before us today. And the yes. question for us right now, for the hope of those who are watching this program at any time that they're watching it, is there hope for repair? And in what direction do we find that hope? If you're asking me that question, all that I can say is I have to believe that what Nanny left with us at some point, we have to respect her. Mm -hmm. She is regarded all over the broad land as a combination of brains, courage, and, and incorruptibleness. She is a truth teller, and I have to believe that the day will come when we will listen to the views and visions of Nanny Helen Burroughs for our race and our country in the interest of our children of all races. Colonel, it is always a tremendous honor having you on. This will not be the last time. Your voice is so uh, prescient at this particular time. We need this information. We need this pathway to redemption. Uh, the church certainly has sold its soul uh, to the ill-begotten devil of political science uh, and political correctness and that radical, bitter hatred that's been promulgated throughout our culture demonizes the exact pursuit of equality that was instilled in us by the big three, Frederick Douglass, Booker T. Washington, and Nanny Helen Burroughs. How can people read your opinion piece as I'll be sharing it 
uh, as we have on this particular program. Uh, how can people get your news and information regarding Nanny Helen Burroughs? If they go to the opinion piece or, and they will see in there the website, which has my email uh, as well as my telephone. I'm available 24 seven to talk to anybody about Nanny Helen Burroughs. And not only the people that might agree, but people who disagree. Yes. I have already received uh, a one letter in support of what I wrote and one letter against. And I answered both of them saying, this is great. We have a discussion going. So nburroughsinfo.org will give you the, the website. But I please ask people to read it first and then Thank to you. come and ask me questions and let me share my views with you. You know, we need your views and America needs its soul uh, restored. And if they ever get back to reading Nanny Helen Burroughs, I believe that that restoration would come from the Lord. Without yes, further sir. ado, I thank God for you, for your service to our country to this nation and for keeping the dream and the vision of Nanny Harlan Burroughs alive. We'll be back with you uh, in a few couple Could of I weeks. say one thing? Sure. Mm -hmm. Nanny, Nanny had a sense of humor, and this is why I think she and my mother were buddies. <laughs> Nanny said, everything in the modern household is controlled by switches except the children. <laughs> I think she and my mother hung out together. There you go. I'm telling you, uh, Colonel, I believe a few switches would change a whole lot of Black Lives Mattering. Thank you, sir. <laughs> God bless you, sir. Uh, what a tremendous honor it is and what a enjoyable experience it is to have Colonel James Why? I want you all to know that I would have taken tonight off I would have. I, I took off Wednesday night. I took off Thursday because I'm trying to recover and recoup and get prepared for marshalling TECN TV towards what it has to do over the next two years and preparing for a meeting with all of my team and hosts on Sunday afternoon. And I really just wanted to step away for a few moments, rest and recoup. But the Lord said, Ken, Bring Colonel Jim on. You need Colonel Jim's voice. They don't need to hear you. They need to hear Colonel Jim. Uh, and I want you all to know, for as long as the Lord talks to me, Colonel Jim will be coming on our network because he is telling America exactly what has to take place, not only in the home, first in the home, then you spread it abroad, to the church, Oh my God, there is such corruption in the church that needs to be just repudiated and repented from and torn out and then into our political culture. Because where a man goes with God, no man can stop him from his faith. And unfortunately, we've been given religion rather than faith over the past few years with a lot of preachers who can earnestly tell you uh, like the gentleman down in Georgia who is running for the U.S. Senate, Warnock, who stated that the Bible justifies abortion. My God, how sick our culture has become. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be back with more of the best in urban conservative talk, but people ask me all the time, Ken, why do you stop at 10 o'clock and I would have loved talking, trust me, I would have loved talking to Jim, uh, Colonel James White for everyone else. I would have loved talking to him for the next two to three hours and we could have just about Nanny Helen Burroughs. But there is a very important question, in fact, two, that I need to ask you. Number one, do you know where your children are? But the most important question is not even that one. The most important question is this. Do your children know where you are? It's 10 p.m. Do you know where your children are?